Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Today, as you might have guessed, we're talking about keyboards. And specifically, what we're looking at is how to rejuvenate the rubber key contacts that have too high of a resistance and won't work anymore. Resistance is futile. This quest actually started more than a year ago with an Amiga 500 I got that had some bad keys. I tried several things at that time to fix it. I even did a video about it, but I didn't have any luck with the type of key stems and contacts that are used on these keyboards. However, the coatings and things worked fine on things like the rubber keypads for remote controls. In fact, the keypads for the 3D printers that I fixed in that video still work great today. I'll put a link to that below. But the method to bring these Mitsumi type key contacts back to life eluded me. And at the time I said, maybe that'll be sufficient. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's possible to fix these. So this started me on a journey to find out what was happening to the conductive rubber key contacts and what we might be able to do about it. Let's have a look at what I found. With these Amiga key contacts in particular, I had a very good idea that the problem might be contamination due to oil. Let's have a look at the clip from that video and we'll find out why. There is something oily around here. Remember I said that the return key looked kind of shiny. Get this in a light just right, you can I'll see that. Get... There we go. I think you can just see that, how those right in there that kind of have a, an oily appearance. So I started doing a lot of research on conductive silicone rubber, you know, to try to find out how it was made, you know, can it become contaminated? And if it can become contaminated, how do we clean it up? Now I found out that the rubber is made conductive by adding some form of carbon black to it, like graphite. And depending on the amount of graphite and how it's processed, it can give the rubber different properties. And I also thought it was interesting that the conduction in the rubber not only comes from the graphite particles touching each other, but there's also some sort of quantum tunneling effect. Now, I don't pretend to understand the quantum mechanics involved. I just thought it was interesting that there was more to it than meets the eye. I also saw reference to silicon rubber bleeding or leaching silicon oil on a website where a fellow had a TV remote control that he had to take apart periodically to wipe out the silicon oil inside. And I'd never heard of that. And I did some more research and I found this paper from a group of researchers in China where they talk about this problem and what causes it, the type of processing that goes into making the silicon rubber that leads to it, and all the problems it can cause in the electronics equipment. And I just thought that was terribly interesting. Now, I don't think that's the problem with our key contacts. Uh, they haven't suddenly decided to start leaching silicon oil after 30 years. It's just an interesting tidbit. One other interesting find was that silicon rubber has a high degree of gas permeability, which means that gases can seep all the way through the rubber itself. And I guess this is why they don't use silicon rubber in a lot of gas sealing applications unless its ability to withstand, you know, extreme temperatures is really important. And it made me wonder, you know, through the years, uh, is atmospheric gas allowed to, you know, seep through the rubber that way? Or if there's cigarette smoke or other things in the air, is that, you know, making its way into the rubber somehow? At this point, I had learned a little bit about conductive silicon rubber, how it was made, and a few interesting tidbits about it. But it took even more research to find out that, yes, it can become contaminated with oils. And then I tried to find, well, what can the average Joe do to clean those oils out of that silicon rubber? And, you know, being the internet, I found all sorts of silly suggestions, things that would never work. 
And I also found a few interesting things that seemed like good advice. Uh, very interesting was the fact that normal solvents you would think to use for oils, uh, things like alcohol or acetone, things like that, they just don't work on silicon oils on silicon rubber. There were some, you know, commercial industrial chemicals that are used when cleaning out molds and things like that. But of course, you know, that's not something that as hobbyists we're going to be able to buy. I also knew that ether, you know, automotive starting fluid, will soften silicon rubber. I've used it to clean silicon caulk off things. But of course, while that might clean the oil out of the rubber, it would also destroy the rubber. So that wasn't going to be much use. And I found a few references to suggest that mild caustic cleaners might do a good job at preserving the silicon rubber while cleaning the oil contamination from it. Now you might be saying, hey Bert, what the heck is a mild caustic cleaner? Well, that's just something like ammonia or Formula 409 or fly soap. So I set about to try some common household chemicals and see how they would do cleaning up these key contacts. And what I chose was, you know, the normal type of ammonia you get at the grocery store for your laundry. I think this is usually like 2 to 3%. It's not very strong stuff. Uh, some Formula 409, which is a, you know, household type cleaner. I used both of these full strength. And I had some of this Purple Power in the garage. This is kind of a heavy duty cleaner degreaser for engines and things like that. And I diluted this 10 to 1 with water, which is what the directions suggested for common cleaning chores. So I tested all three of these chemicals on some contaminated key stems to see what the results would be. So now I knew what chemicals I wanted to try. And I had some old 35 millimeter film canisters laying around. And these were the perfect size for putting a few of these Amiga slash C128 uh, key stems in and a little bit of the chemical and they seal tight so I don't have to worry about the chemical evaporating. So that would work out good. Uh, the next problem is, well, how do I test the resistance? Now I'm sure you've done what I've done in the past. I've tried to take my probes and poke into the rubber on these plungers and that doesn't work so well. Um, it's hard getting it on there. It's hard getting it on with the same pressure. The probes are pointy and they poke into it and you can't get repeatable readings. So I figured, you know, I would make some sort of test fixture. And you guys know me, I like making test fixtures. You know, I have like this fixation for fixtures. So here is the first fixture I came up with. I just laid this out in a mechanical CAD program and 3D printed a little housing for it, which has the apertures to fit the Amiga key stems. Now, this side right here with these two thin bars were to measure just the foot of that that makes contact, but that didn't work out too well. And this worked fine, but I thought, you know, I can also make this work for Commodore 64 key stems. So I then came up with this circuit board. Now on this one, I laid this out in Eagle, well actually the Eagle integration in Diffusion 360. I created uh, this component in the component library and laid out the board in there. And this worked fine. The problem with machining boards out like this is that the copper always oxidizes and you know if you let it set for a couple months you're going to get a different resistance reading because the surface is slightly more resistant. But now that it was laid out in an actual uh, electronics CAD program, I could get actual circuit boards made like this. And then you'll notice the contacts there don't look like copper, they look like gold. And it's a purple board, which must mean Osh Park. I see it there. It's got a slightly bigger enclosure. Got one side for the C64 stems, another for the Amiga and Commodore 128 stems. And uh, this whole design is on my GitHub page, and I'll put the link down below. It's very easy to build. You just solder a couple of wires on here. Got four screws in the corner. These are 440 or three millimeter screws, just, you know, what, three millimeters, three sixteenths inch long. That's all you need. And I made 
the model, this whole shape around here, parametric, so you can tweak it, you know, to help it match your printer if you need to. So with this fixture, you can take the key stem. This is hard to do on camera, and put it in here like this, and I can get repeatable resistance readings now. So I can definitely see if soaking in the chemical is going to make a difference or not works out pretty slick. I've also found this is really handy when you're testing key stems. Uh, like when you take a keyboard apart to clean it and before you put it back together, you can run all of them through here, test them all, make sure they're fine. That way you have a, a very good chance that the keyboard is going to work properly when you put it back together. You're not going to put it back together and go, oh, these five keys don't work. You can check it all ahead of time. I like that part a lot too. The testing procedure went something like this. I would put some of the chemical like ammonia in the film canister, drop in a plunger after I scratched a letter coat into the side so I could tell them apart. And then I would let that soak in there. Now I initially started measuring every hour or two and then I found out that reaction didn't happen that fast. But I went ahead and I tried to do that for each chemical so that data was a little more consistent. But in reality, depending on how high of resistance these are to start with, you need to let them soak uh, from one to four days. I had some that were over a megabyte. A megabyte. I had some that were over a megohm in resistance, and uh, those took a little while to do. After they had sat in here and I wanted to take a measurement, I would fish it out with pliers, rinse it off in the sink, and set it aside to dry and then pop it in the fixture and just push down lightly. You can you know, push down differently and it's going to change the resistance a little bit. And if the resistance was still pretty high, I would um, put it back in the chemical and let it soak some more. And I found on the really high resistance uh, stems, uh, let's say the ones that were a few hundred K to a meg, that it seemed to use up the chemical after a couple of days and there would be kind of a white uh, filmy coating inside the canister and on the stem and I would have to wash that off, put in some new chemical and then it would start uh, working again a couple more days and it would be fine. Another thing I found is it seemed that given that the the ammonia and you know the 409 and the purple power were all diluted to some extent with water that the rubber was absorbing a little water and that was altering the resistance value and i tried just letting them uh, air dry and that helped somewhat i tried wiping them with alcohol and that wiped somewhat and uh, finally i found that after i was done soaking them in the chemical I would let them, uh, you know, rinse them, let them air dry, and then I would soak them in some 99% alcohol for about 48 hours, and that would dry all the water out of them, and I would get a really low resistance then. I sent one of these testing fixtures to a friend who was experimenting with some Commodore 64 key stems, and when he put his ammonia in a container, he added a little graphite, thinking that might help. Um, and it really did rejuvenate his Commodore 64 stems and he was able to rescue a keyboard that way. And I got to wondering how much the graphite was helping and I wound up getting some of the same graphite he did trying to repeat his experiments. And but I was able, since I had some more stems to do more of a controlled experiment and testing it with just ammonia versus ammonia with some graphite in it. And I didn't find that there was a difference with the graphite. Although, you know, if I just, pulled it out of the graphite solution after about 48 hours and let it air dry, I would notice there was a little graphite on the surface. I wondered, well, how much resistance was in that thin graphite coating? And I tried making a thick coating of pencil lead on a piece of paper and measuring the resistance, which was pretty high. And I measured the resistance of a, an actual pencil lead, which was much lower. But uh, the point I'm getting at, I think the coating of the graphite that you get just from soaking this in graphite and liquid. The uh, amount of graphite you get on the surface is so thin it's not really aiding uh, in lowering the resistance. 
but it was a darn good idea. It was another interesting experiment. And I'm also not sure how long that would last on the surface, but like I said, you don't know till you try things. That's the fun part about experimenting. Another minor glitch I had is I managed to crack these key stems when I was pulling the caps off. Even though I was careful, I still cracked three or four of them. And this is a nylon-like plastic, which is typically very, very difficult to glue. And after doing some looking around, I found this Scotchweld SF20, which is a very thin uh, instant adhesive, you know, like a CA type glue, but it's supposed to work very well on plastic. And I did a couple of these uh, last evening and let them sit overnight and cure and then popped a key cap in it and it seemed to work just fine. I thought I would save this last one to try to do it here on the video. I've got my magnifier here so I can see what I'm doing. And I found that if I hold this up and gently tip the bottle, just till it starts running out. Like I said, it's very thin. I put the knife in the crack, which both holds the crack open and it makes a nice handle. I'm squeezing it on the sides here in and out to try to work the glue in. I'm gonna wipe off the excess and then poke it in these alligator clips like that to keep a little pressure on there. Now I'll let this sit in here five or 10 minutes so the glue gets started uh, to being set up and I'll take it out and I'll scrape off the excess glue on the outside with my fingernail and then I'm going to put it back in here and I'm going to let it set at least overnight. Uh, even this instant adhesive type glue gains a lot of strength in the first 24 hours so I always like letting it set and do its thing. You might find that some of the glue has gotten down inside the little square part of the thing there. So I took my knife and scraped that out gently. The next question was, well, if we can reduce the resistance of the key contacts, how low does that have to be? I know the, the ones that work that seem okay or unaffected seem to be around 200 ohms, but what if we could get them down to say 500 ohms? Was, would that be okay? Would that still work? Well, I rigged up a test like this where I have a 0.1% precision uh, resistance decade box. And I have that wired in series with a little push button switch here to act like a key. And I jumped it across a couple of the pins on the keyboard connector on a Commodore 64. Uh, not these exact pins. I'm, this is just a representative of what I did, but I looked at the schematic and found a row and column that would give me a key, which would show a key press on the screen. And I powered up the computer and I kept increasing the resistance and pressing the button and watching the screen. And when it got to the point where it wasn't working right, I made note of the resistance. I found on both the Commodore 64 and the Commodore 128 that about the 2K range, it started getting flaky. When you press the key, it acted like it had a really, really fast key repeat, and you'd get multiple characters at a time. You get 100, 200 ohms above 2K, and it wouldn't register a key press at all. So based on this, you know, it seemed like you know 5, 600, 700 ohms uh, contact resistance for those key stems would work just fine. And that seemed like maybe it was a reasonable possibility then to get them all cleaned up to that level. I did not test the Amiga. I'm assuming since the electronics are a similar design, although the Amiga has its own uh, microcontroller that scans the keyboard matrix and it reports that back to the main computer by serial line, the electronics is very similar. Uh, Chuck Hutchins did a video where he tested this on a PET and he found 1K was about the limit on the PET. Well, how did all this fooling around with different chemicals and such work out? Well, I'll pop up the results right here and you can see we started with resistances ranging from about 1K up to 1 mega ohm. 
and we got down to where everything was less than 300 ohms, which is well within the range of working properly. It really surprised me it worked that well with just simple household chemicals. So, of the three chemicals I tested, which worked better? That's kind of hard to say because they all worked rather well. And I didn't have enough test samples that were all within a, a small enough resistance range to get a good idea if one worked a little better than another. I think it comes down to, you know, how easy it is for you to get where you live and how inexpensive it is. And I think the winner in those two categories is definitely the ammonia. Ammonia is ammonia. You can get it anywhere and it's pretty cheap. So you just, you know, go to the store and get the one or two percent ammonia that you buy for the laundry and that'll do fine. So you've got your ammonia to clean them and the alcohol to dry them out and you're good to go. So after months of experimenting, here is the magic formula. Soak your key stems in household ammonia from one to four days, depending on the resistance value. If they're closer to one meg ohm, go for four days. And if they're just a few K, go for one day. Rinse them with water and let them air dry. Then you'll want to soak them in 99% alcohol for about 48 hours, take them out and let them air dry again, and you should have some rejuvenated key stems. Remember, a resistance value of 1K or less is probably okay for most vintage computer systems, but your mileage may vary. Say, if you're a subscriber, I would like to say thanks. I really appreciate it a lot. It's encouraging to see the number of subscribers grow and it really helps other people find the channel as well. If you're not a subscriber, well, what are the heck you waiting on? If you look down below, you'll see a rectangular button that says subscribe. And you know, if you click on that guy, it will subscribe you to the channel. Then you'll notice a bell shaped icon. If you click on that guy, YouTube will be nice enough to let you know just as soon as I post a new video. That way you'll get to be one of the first ones to see it when it comes out. I'd also like to thank the Patreons and other folks who help support the Hey Bert channel. And if you're interested in finding out more about that, if you look down below, you can find links to Patreon and Subscribestar and find out a little more about supporting Hey Bert. If you have any questions or comments, we'll just leave them in the comments section down below. I would love to hear from you. Let me know what your experiences are with trying to clean these type of key contacts. Uh, different types of key contacts like the PET, etc. might have a little different results, but I'd be interested to hear what your results are if you do try this. Please let me know. Well, until next time, bye.